rotation stay healthy. Jacob DeGrom got off to a rocky start. Noah Syndergaard, Stephen Matz had been on the injured list a couple of times this year. And outside of Pete Alonso, when you got Robinson Cano in this lineup, you felt like, okay, well, you've got a middle now. You can kind of, like, kind of get behind. Michael Conforto has been better as of late. Wilson Ramos has yep. been nice offensively, but... Uh, this is a team that's kind of in shambles at this point emotionally, and that's difficult when you're trying to win games in your division. Not the right division to be in shambles in either because there are a number of competitive teams this year. How about the Atlanta Braves? Six and a half up. Now, preseason-wise, I told you, Jens, this is my pick yeah. for the East. I, I love their young team they put together. I love their offense. Acuna Jr. last year was the guy that came on. They have other players coming on this year. Here is the National League East. So the Mets not completely out of it, nine out. Of course, there's still the wild card race. They're in that, too. Miami, they're out of it. But you've got four teams here with Atlanta, Philly, Washington, maybe the Mets then, too, that are good ball clubs you've got to compete with. The thing you like about Atlanta, and they just got Dallas Keuchel into that rotation. Mike fulton just sent down to AAA Gwinnett for them. The rotation has been the biggest question mark for them to be able to win a division title. Can they have enough consistency there? Back into their bullpen has suffered some significant injuries. Rodas Vizcaino, their close at the beginning of the year, he's out. Luke Jackson has stepped in. They've had to find some answers and kind of piece it together there. The offense has been the biggest reason why they are leading this division. Acuna Jr. should start the All-Star game for the National League. Freddie Freeman is an MVP candidate. Dan Z. Swanson might be comeback player of the year in the National League with what he's done offensively and defensively. And then Josh Donaldson. Uh, Jim Murphy is smiling down there in the truck right now because the bringer of rain has really brought the thunder for that lineup. It's been fun to watch the Atlanta Braves. Can they continue this? And can that rotation, much like the Minnesota Twins, can they hold on and get enough consistency if they do that? That's a dangerous club in a short postseason series. Well, like the National League East, and the Braves have that, that very formidable offense. I think in the American League Central, it's the same story. Yeah. The Minnesota Twins, their offense, we thought that it would be good coming into this year, but it has overachieved there in first place by eight games. But the Indians are coming on. They have the best winning percentage in the month of June for an American League team. They're now seven games over the 500 mark, and it is because of their offense. Pitching has been consistent with both clubs, and you always need that. But bottom line, the teams that are on top of the Central here are the teams that are playing the best offense right now. With the Indians, and, and they've taken advantage of their schedule at this point. They did not do that in April and May, and hopefully you don't look back at the end of the year and say, God, a couple of those series wins. Maybe this is a five, four, who, who knows, even three-game deficit. But here, here I think is the bottom line. If the Indians can get this deficit down to five games or maybe even six games by the time the first half is over, yeah. the first opponent, opponent you're going to face are the Minnesota Twins. You win that series, now you're down to four or five games. It's a whole different thing. And Minnesota's starting rotation hasn't had to pitch with expectations, much less pressure of trying to defend the top spot in the division for the last four to five years. That's the biggest question I have for them. Had an opportunity to get Dallas Keuchel, did not do that. Had an opportunity to get Craig Kimbrell, did not do that. That's been their biggest question mark. The consistency of the rotation, who's going to close out games for them consistently in the back end of the bullpen? If they can't answer that, Indians have a legitimate shot to make some noise and make them uncomfortable in the second half. So the Central is definitely not out of the question. So folks now starting to talk wild card. You've got seven teams right now with a shot. You maybe have five teams with a legitimate shot. That can still change because as we're here approaching July, there's plenty of time to go. But when you look at the American League, it's interesting because Tampa Bay was so good in the month of May. Eight, yeah. And now in June, they're starting to come back to the pack. They almost look like a runaway wild card team <laughs> if they did it uh, with the American yeah, League East. But now they're coming back to the pack. So I think you've got the Yankees in the East right now. They're going to be the team to catch. But then you've got Tampa Bay and Boston to be concerned with. In the Central, of course, you have the Indians. The White Sox on the far periphery, I don't think they're going to be there. In the West, though, you've got pretty much everybody in that except for what, maybe Seattle? Man, I, I don't know. It's going to be really tough to catch Houston. I just think with all the reinforcements they have coming back, they just got Altuve back. Springer is on the men. Correa, we, who knows? So we could see right. how long it takes, but it's not like they need to rush him Well, back. Houston will win that division, I think. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you. But in the wild card, I mean, the Angels... The Rangers, I mean, do you the trust, A's, do you they're trust all kind of on the outside. I don't, I don't trust Texas as far as I can throw them. I'll tell you who I, I think needs to get healthy. If Tampa Bay gets healthy, yeah. they're losing Diego Castillo, and they've lost Jose Alvarado to the injured list. They also have lost Tyler Glass now, who started the year and could have been a runaway Cy Young winner if he stayed healthy. He was throwing absolute lightning bolts from the mouth. Their offense has now shown some cracks, sure. but this this uh -huh. whole team is built around run prevention, much like the Indians were at the beginning of the season. I think if Tampa gets healthy, 
they can run down the Yankees and give them some fits because the Yankees rotation is in shambles at this point. I mean, they still don't know when Luis Severino is going to come back. Yes, they can probably bullpen their way through the second half, but that's a tall order. You're asking a lot of big innings, especially within a division. Do you trust CC Sabathia? Do you trust J.A. Happ the way he's pitched? Yeah. Tanaka is one splitter away from going on the injured list. And then what has happened to James Paxton? I mean, there's so many know. questions there. So the, the East right now, yeah, it's 4-4 four, four well, and a half. What about Blake Snell? I mean, he still has not gotten yeah. anywhere close to the form that he showed last year. Now, he had an injury earlier. Maybe that's a part of this. But I would think for Tampa Bay to be a real serious contender, they need him to at least be close to yeah. what he was. Yeah, right? I, I can agree with that. And, and there's there's some concern there, too, because you feel like we watched him here uh, when Shane Beaver matched him pitch for pitch. Uh, there's, a, I think, a lot of question marks for him, too. That being said, you, you look at where the wild card is right now and, and still way, way too early in this thing. But you like where the Indians are trending, taking advantage of the schedule. You still have to beat good teams. Sure. It's not like you're going to get to play Kansas City and Detroit and Baltimore right. for the rest of the year. Minnesota got healthy on them, so you have to give them credit for winning the games they should have. The Indians should be able to do the same. Let's see what happens in the second half of the season when you got to play Minnesota 15 more times, when you're going to have to play the American League East again, and you're going to have to go to New York and be there for eight days and play the Yankees and the Mets. It's going to be a tall order. We're going to find out a lot about this team the first two weeks in the second half. All right, our rain delay continues here in Cleveland as the Indians and the Royals are in the fourth inning. It's one nothing Kansas City. And what Merrifield Homer is the only offense we've seen thus far from either side. When we come back, Addie Joss revealed as we continue in this rain delay here today. The Indians are riding a three-game winning streak. They've been playing some great ball in June. We hope to resume this one, but right now, it's still raining in Cleveland. Keep it here with us. Still uh, raining in Cleveland. I wonder if it's still raining in Akron. I love my job. I'm there when people need me. They count on me. Because I do what it takes. Whenever. Wherever. I don't do it for praise. I want to make them happy. I'm proud to work for an American company.
the team that occupied League Park was a member of the American League. And after a few fledgling years, they had amassed enough talent to challenge for a pennant. You had a star like Napoleon Lajoie. You had a star like Elmer Flick. You had Bill Bradley, great third baseman. And, of course, Addy Joss is the dominant figure on the pitching staff. Led by player-manager Napoleon Lajoie, they adopted his nickname and became the Cleveland Naps. While sports writers overlooked the team, picking them to finish no better than seventh in the league, the 1908 season would go down as one of the closest races in history. That same year, Take Me Out to the Ball Game was written and recorded and became the most popular song in America. It would be another 26 years before it was ever performed at a major league game. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the ball. Construction on Cleveland's West Side Market also began in 1908. It would take four years to build at a cost of nearly $750,000. While building commenced on the city's west side, an unthinkable tragedy unfolded east of the Cuyahoga River. March 4, 1908, began as an ordinary day in the Collinwood neighborhood. It was Ash Wednesday. Children at Lakeview Elementary were busy learning their arithmetic in the crowded schoolhouse when the fire alarm sounded just after 9.30 a.m. In a matter of minutes, the Georgia Pine interior was ablaze. The brick facade acted like a chimney, and the school was engulfed in flames. Whoa. By the time firefighters arrived in their horse-drawn equipment, the school was completely overtaken by the fire. 172 children died, making it the worst fire disaster in American school history. A mass burial was held at Lakeview Cemetery, where the remains of 19 unidentified students were buried with their classmates. For many residents who had lost so much in the fire, they quickly packed up and left town, leaving behind what little savings they had in the local bank. Just a few weeks later, a city in desperate need of distraction would turn its eyes to the local nine and witness a baseball season they would not soon forget. Francisco Endor here in baseball. Mm -hmm. Today is a good thing. Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Girls Club of Cleveland State is a great thing. 54% of the adults who were Boys and Girls Club members say the club saved their life. To find out more, visit www.splithits.org. That's splithits.org. How did I do? This is our daughter, Emmy. She was such a bright light in our lives. When she was just 19 months old, we lost her to drowning. I'm Bodie Miller, and this is my wife, Morgan. Emmy drowned in a pool at a neighbor's house. She slipped out the back door, and in the space of minutes, she was gone. Drowning is the single leading cause of death in children ages 1 to 4. We believe it should be the number one thing parents think about when it comes to safety. Drowning is preventable. This is urgent. Please talk with your pediatrician about how to keep your child safe. The Indians are on. Fox Sports Go to two. Goodbye! Stream Indians baseball on Sports Time Ohio and Fox Sports Go. And give yourself the best seat in the house. The toughest thing about baseball is when you do go on the run. If you play well, it certainly helps, but it, it, it's a grind. You're always welcome when you come back to the ballpark. Everyone's smiling. They're looking forward to you. Hey, welcome home. Let's have a good home stand. You have a much better feeling when you're at home. Even when you prepare, life doesn't always go as planned. Today, one in seven seniors live in poverty. To learn how you can help, visit aarpfoundation.org. Adrian Joss was born in Woodland, Wisconsin in 1880. Whoa. His father, Jacob, died when Addie was just 10 years old, leaving his mother to raise him alone. 
Teresa Joss worked mostly as a seamstress to make ends meet, but sewing was not on the cards for young Eddie. He found baseball at the age of seven, and by the time he reached high school, was already something of a phenom. He moved on to Wayland Academy, and then to Sacred Heart College, where before long, he drew the attention of professional scouts. The Toledo Mudhens offered him his first pro contract, and after just two years, the big league hound dogs were closing in. On April 26, 1902, he made his major league debut with Cleveland and nearly threw a no-hitter, settling instead for a disputed one-hit shutout in a 3 to nothing win over the St. Louis Browns. And those were the days there was just one umpire behind the plate and uh, a short fly ball where Cat hit a little bleeder to right field. And a right fielder came racing in, great name, Zaza Harvey what was his name. He appeared to catch it off his shoe tops, but the umpire stood behind the plate and never moved from his vantage point. He thought it was trapped, and he called it safe. And that, that was the base hit that the Browns got, and that was it. Over the next several years, Addy perfected his craft, leading the circuit in earned run average in 1904 and winning a league-best 27 games in 1907. Standing 6'3 and weighing 180 pounds, he was known as the signpost, hairpin, and the human slat. His sidearm slinging style made it difficult for hitters to pick up the ball. He featured a sinking fastball, a curve with pinpoint accuracy, and a changeup to keep hitters off balance. By 1908, Addy was married with two young children and made his home in nearby Toledo. He was a renaissance man for his times, as talented on the field as he was off it. And, and not only was he a great ball player, he was highly educated. Uh, he was a college-educated ball player at a time when many of his colleagues and contemporaries were not. Uh, he also was an innovator. He helped um, create uh, blueprints for an electronic scoreboard, which was a, a, certainly a newfangled addition for ballparks at the time. Um, so he, he really had a lot to say, and he, sometimes he even said it in newspapers. Um, and a lot of the stuff we have at the Baseball Hall of Fame is great to really get a good idea of what he was, not only as a ball player, but as a human, uh, as an individual, as a family man, uh, as an innovator uh, as well. The 1908 season was a nail-biter to the finish. With only five games remaining, Detroit, Cleveland, and Chicago were separated by one game in the loss column. On Friday, October 2nd, Chicago came to Cleveland for a pivotal series. Chicago's Big Ed Walsh, a 40-game winner that year, faced Addie Joss in a must-win game for both teams. Fever pitch. Coming into the last few games of the season with the chance to get to the World Series. And again, by 1908, you're talking about getting to the World Series is a huge deal. And none of the, you know, no wild cards, no divisional championships. You either make it or you don't. And so everything's on the line. It was do or die. It was a uh, you know, loser go home for the most part. Everybody knew it was going to be Ed Walsh against Addy. Walsh had already won 39 ball games. He was having a magnificent season. So this was going to be a battle for the ages. You know, it was a statement game for the Indians or for the Naps, as they were called at that time period. Uh, fighting the Tigers, fighting the White Sox for the American League pennant. They needed their ace to put on a big performance, and that's certainly what he did. Before the crowd arrived, Joss and Walsh, who had become friendly rivals, sat together in anticipation of what would be one of the greatest pitching duels the game had ever seen. Walsh was nearly unhittable. He struck out 15 Cleveland batters, an American League record that stood until 1936, when a young Iowa farm boy named Bob Feller fanned 17 batters against Philadelphia. Cleveland managed just four hits, and their only run scored on a third strike that eluded Walsh's catcher in the third inning. While Walsh was pitching the game of his life, 
Addy Joss was pitching his way into baseball immortality. Through six innings, Joss had faced 18 White Sox batters and retired them all without incident. About the seventh inning, I began to realize that not one of the Sox had reached first base. No one on the bench dared breathe a word to that effect. Had he done so, he would have been chased to the clubhouse. Even I rapped on wood when I thought of it. Caddy Joss. Down to their last at bat, Chicago sent three pinch hitters to face Joss in the night. It hardly mattered. He retired the side in order and authored a perfect game, just the second in league history. 27 up, 27 down. And he did it on an astonishing 74 pitches. This game meant absolutely everything, and he came through with probably one of the most pleasant performances in the history of the game. I don't see anyone could have really topped that one. Uh, everyone knows every pitch can mean you're out of the pennant race and you lose it. He was absolutely perfect at that. Ed Walsh, who would eventually be enshrined in Cooperstown, gave all the credit to his friend, Addy. I'm sorry that we lost, of course, but seeing that we did have to lose, I'm glad that Addy took down a record that goes to so few. It is something to be proud of. Yes, I pitched a fairly good game myself, but Joss pitched better. Ed Walsh, Chicago White Sox. Joss himself was equally gracious while basking in the glow of victory. I did not try for such a record. All I was doing was trying to beat Chicago, for the game meant so much to us, and Walsh was pitching the game of his life. I never saw him have so much. Addy Joss. The euphoria that filled League Park was short-lived. Cleveland lost the next two games and the pennant to Detroit by a half game. The Tigers had a rainout, which at that time was not required to be made up. The rule was consequently changed following the season, but by then, it was little consolation to Addy and the Naps. You need a mobile phone, and you love to save money. So get Spectrum Mobile and save up to 40% on your monthly bill with the best network, the best devices, for the best value. Spectrum Mobile. Number one thing we can do for the environment and the economy, if we do it properly, we have a solution. And it's working. Standardized labels, they help people recycle more, and they help people recycle right. Let's recycle across America, and let's recycle right. To be part of the standardized label solution, visit letsrecycleright.org. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. For many kids, just showing up to school is a challenge. Staying through graduation is even harder. So at Communities and Schools, we do just what our name says. Our staff brings a community of resources to meet each student's need right in their school, doing whatever it takes to keep kids focused so they see what we see, a bright future. Join in at communitiesandschools.org. It's such an amazing sports city. Everybody you walk and talk to, whether it's downtown or in the suburbs, they're always talking about the sports team. For something that isn't life and death, people sure care a lot about it, and that's okay. That's the best thing all the Cleveland fans, that they're going to be behind you no matter what. They're going to support you whether you mess up or not. You know, they're going to be loyal. They're good people. They stay behind us all.